Good evening and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum. My name is Estela Lacombi-Frenza. I am a first year studying economics at the college and I'm a member of the JFK Junior Forum Committee here at the Institute of Politics. Before we begin, please note the exit doors which are located on both the park side and the JFK street side of the forum. In the event of an emergency, walk to the exit closest to you and congregate in the JFK park. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones. You can join the conversation online with the hashtag JFK Junior Forum Live and interact with our student-run Instagram at JFK Junior Forum for behind-the-scenes highlights. Please take your seats now and join me in welcoming our guests and Greg Honan and Sakina Hader, student co-chairs of the Economic Diplomacy Initiative Simulation. Hi everyone, thanks for coming uh, to Digital Currency Wars, a National Security Crisis Simulation, ahead, hosted by the Belfer President. Center's Economic Diplomacy Initiative. The Economic Diplomacy Initiative, led by Nick Burns, Larry Summers, and Aditi Kumar, aims to provide analysis and recommendations to policymakers on challenges at the intersection of economic policy and national security. This simulation was developed by a group of Kennedy School students, who created the scenario, delivered policy briefs, and staffed the principals all week. So to start, I want to briefly explain uh, where we are right now. Today, the US is the dominant economic power, in part because of the strength of the US dollar and US financial institutions. No matter how you cut the international monetary system, the dollar is the primary currency. The US leverages this power to do everything from setting trade policy to sanctioning adversaries. We aim to challenge the notion that the US dollar and the US-led monetary system will always retain this lead. With the developments of digital currencies, things could change quickly. It's hard to predict the future, but in this simulation, we'll play out one scenario to learn how the rise of digital currencies could reshape geopolitics. Our scenario takes place two years from today, on November 19th, 2021. We have simulated a world in which one big thing has changed. In March 2020, the People's Bank of China launched a sovereign digital currency known as the digital yuan. China is the only major economy with such a currency in circulation, although several nations, including the UK, Canada, and Israel, are actively considering similar projects. The launch of this digital currency is part of China's digital Silk Road strategy to build its global, political, and economic influence. From investments in tech giants like Huawei to the creation of smart cities along the Belt and Road, this new digital currency is the natural next step. These policies demonstrate an integrated and, crucially, forward-looking Chinese economic diplomacy strategy, while the US and its allies continue to rely on traditional diplomacy tools. So the digital yuan is centrally issued by the People's Bank of China and fully backed by fiat reserves. The currency is stored in digital wallets, and payments can be made using a number of applications, including Alipay, WeChat, and mobile banking apps. It's based on a two-tier system, where the People's Bank of China issues the currency to select banks and payment providers, and then these institutions redistribute it to individuals and to businesses. The banks serve as nodes in a system, confirming and verifying users and transactions through a mutually understood protocol. All transactions are encrypted, and officials at the People's Bank of China have said they aim to strike a balance between anonymity and national security concerns. In our scenario, the digital yuan has taken off rapidly and represents 95% of all domestic payments in China. Retail customers have flocked to the currency because of its ease of use and reduced fees. China has also leveraged its Belt and Road Initiative network in order to promote adoption within the business community. BRI contractors in the Caucasus, Central Asia, and Africa can quickly and cheaply convert digital yuan to local currency using Chinese banks. In addition to this, China has been leading a campaign to increase adoption of the digital yuan across Southeast Asia, expanding the government's influence over the region as a whole. Today, a growing number of retail payments in Indonesia, Myanmar, Cambodia, and Laos are in digital yuan. 
In our scenario, we see this as a strategic decision by China to bring more countries into its sphere of economic and political influence. So on the stage tonight, you will see a live simulation of a National Security Council's Principles Committee meeting at the White House. The participants will react to breaking news, debate policy options, and try to bring together a set of recommendations for the president. Simultaneously, you'll be able to watch how the crisis is being viewed in the outside world by allies, the media, and the public on the screen. Please note, in tonight's simulation, participants are speaking only in their personal capacities. And so with that backdrop in mind, let's begin. This is Jane Perlez. We are following the breaking news coming in from North Korea, where an alarming new round of missile tests suggests that Kim Jong-un has advanced his nuclear program further than Washington has understood. I'm joined by David Sanger, New York Times national security correspondent, live from Harvard Kennedy School. David, how significant is this test? And is it a big breakthrough? Well, Jane, just a few days ago, the North Koreans conducted their first big long-range uh, intercontinental ballistic missile test since November of 2017. And what's interesting about this test was both the nature of it and the range of it. So it, it went about 2,100 miles. Uh, it was aimed south. It went over the Philippines and into the Philippine Sea. But what made it even more complicated and more impressive in some ways was that they released a simulated warhead because they needed to show that they had solved the one big remaining problem that they've had so far, which is their warhead could survive re-entry into the atmosphere and land on a target. And once you've proven that, you've basically solved the last major problem that you need to solve in order to demonstrate that you could deliver a nuclear weapon. We're hearing reports that North Korea may be using China's digital yuan currency to evade sanctions and purchase weapons material. How is the digital yuan being used to thwart American security interests? Well, the, the digital yuan is an opportunity for the North Koreans to break free of the American hold on dollar transactions. The reason that financial sanctions have largely worked against North Korea is that most transactions have to clear uh, banks in dollars. Now, there's always been a fair bit of black market trade, particularly over the North Korean-Chinese border. I've been up on that border, as, as you have, Jane, many times. And, you know, you see oil flowing uh, across. You see people trading in, in goods and using uh, uh, a black market that's been pretty healthy. But the North Koreans can't really buy much on the outside market without having dollars. So now all of a sudden, this digital yuan, which is a digital currency uh, backed by the, the People's Bank of China and, of course, supported by Chinese commercial banks, gives an opportunity to do full transactions without ever having to go through a dollar clearance process. And that means that if the Chinese decide at any point to break free of uh, enforcing the sanctions, they can do so. But what's even better for the Chinese is that there's very little visibility into how these transactions work. So the U.S. would have a very hard time proving that, in fact, the Chinese are participating in sanctions busting. David, thanks for that insight. We'll be right back. <clears throat> Uh, good evening. Thank you all for coming on short notice to the White House for a Principals Committee meeting. Uh, I know that you all have been briefed on the background intelligence on the North Korean missile test that occurred on the 17th of November. The President is following this very closely. I've spoken with her several times since the test. Uh, she believed so strongly in the importance of this that she asked the Vice President to show up for the PC, which as you all know is extremely unusual. Thank you very much, Madam Vice President, for coming. I do hope you make it worth my time. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I'm going to try to run a tight ship here, but uh, I feel the pressure. Uh, so the agenda, as you all know from the read ahead that we sent out to the departments earlier today and from your deputies who met earlier this morning, is very clear. Three important things that we want to talk about. First, 
We're going to review the normal set of response options that we have in response to a North Korean missile test and provocation cycle. Then second, which is the emphasis for the president, is that we want to talk about the potential threat to U.S. national interests by the digital yuan and maybe move off of SWIFT. And of course, we'll conclude by seeing what our interests are at stake here and trying to come up with options for the president so that we can give her uh, a holistic strategy. So before we jump right into it, I'm going to turn it over to my able Deputy National Security Advisor, Aditi Kumar, for an update on the situation and facts. Sure. So on November 17th, North Korea tested an intercontinental ballistic missile that traveled 2,100 miles over southern Japan and landed in the Philippine Sea. Uh, U.S. Pacific Command confirmed its trajectory over Japan. The CIA indicated that this dem demonstration simulated a functioning re-entry vehicle, or RV. A working RV was the last technical hurdle for the North Koreans to reliably deliver a nuclear warhead against a target. Information shared from the South Korean intelligence service uh, from human sources indicates that North Korea used an appropriately weighted dummy warhead for the test. The CIA believes, with a high degree of confidence, that this missile can carry a nuclear weapon, like the one North Korea tested in September of 2017, capable of destroying a major American city. Taken together, these assessments apply. Uh, one, that North Korea now poses a direct nuclear threat to our forces in Guam. And two, uh, with a medium degree of confidence, the CIA assesses that within six to nine months, North Korea will have the capability to deliver a nuclear warhead against the continental United States. We believe North Korea has been able to evade UN sanctions and purchase important commodities, essential missile components, and nuclear expertise using the digital yuan currency. This has helped develop their missile program. The digital yuan allows North Korea to bypass US and United Nations Security Council sanctions. Moreover, we are completely unable to track these transactions since they don't go through SWIFT or US clearing or settlement <coughs> systems. The full payments chain is controlled by the Chinese. Okay, thank you, uh, Aditi. As, as I mentioned, we have a well-developed set of options, so at this point, what I'd like to do is turn, of course, to the Vice President first, uh, but I just wanted to remind you, because we have a limited amount of time, we're gonna keep our comments for this opening section to one or two minutes so that we can move on to the conversation about the digital currency. Madam Vice President, what's your perspective on the strategic situation as it is? Sure. Um, I know you run the process here, and I don't want to second guess you, but I just want to say I think it's odd it's taken us two days to meet after this missile test. Just take that as it is. Yes, ma'am. No. Um, <laughs> however, I, I do want to begin this meeting, and I will be a consistent voice on this point, is that I don't want us to lose track of the large geopolitical context in which this is happening. Of course, we've got this urgent issue related to North Korea, but we secondly, and I would say even more importantly, have uh, a concern about China, and this has to be looked at. This digital yuan has to be looked at in the context of US-China strategic competition. Um, and that is the context in which I hope we'll have this conversation. China is our most important bilateral relationship, and as we all know, it's gotten much more contentious over the last few years. And in my mind, this, uh, this development of a digital yuan really poses some real advantages for the Chinese and some real potential costs and risks for the United States. So on the advantages front, I hope we'll talk about how, you know, we, we were caught flat-footed on the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, the first effort of the Belt and Road Initiative by China, we didn't have a strategic response that wasn't our administration, but let's not be in that position again for the second chapter of the Belt and Road Initiative, this one, a virtual, a digital currency. Um, and keep in mind that the data, we've all heard them say the data is the new oil, and in the world of competition around artificial intelligence, the fact that China now has data not only relating to 1.4 billion Chinese, but also, um, however, hundreds of millions of Indonesians, of uh, Vietnamese, whomever is using this currency, gives China this real advantage in AI. Um, on the cost 
and risk to the United States, I'm sure we'll talk, our Secretary of State, I'm sure we'll talk about sanctions and uh, how we've been so reliant on this tool and how it is really potentially jeopardized by this. Um, but I also worry about are we, are we going down the road of bifurcating the global economy? And how far down are we on that road? And do our options actually take us further down that road? And what does that mean uh, for the health of the US economy and the global economy and that of our allies? So um, in, in short, I, I think this meeting is long overdue. And uh, I hope we'll make good use of our time. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice President. As you know, the, the DC process can sometimes take a little while to get everything together. So we're, of course, doing our best. Secretary Burns. Um, no need for excuses. I just want action. Yes, ma'am. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> Secretary Burns, could you, could you give us your perspective on diplomatic options for the president and the country as they relate to the missile test first? And we'll move on to the, the digital currency issues later. Thank you. Madam Vice President, uh, you won't be surprised. I agree completely with your brilliant remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> colleagues, we're facing twin crises. The first is China's central bank issued digital currency, its impact on American economic power, on the role of the dollar as a reserve currency. The State Department's focused on that, but the capacity in this government is with Larry and Gary and Neha. We're obviously going to defer to you. It would be interesting to know for our group, however, do we have such a capacity? Are the Treasury and Fed or anyone else in our government, National Economic Council, developing this? Shouldn't we have it? That's one question. Second, North Korea's uh, missile test. Ash and I, of course, have been in constant communication. We talked just a couple of hours ago. We're in a tight spot. Our major uh, means to contain and deter the North Koreans has been financial sanctions. And now that's imperiled by the fact that North Korea is accessing the digital yuan in the medium term. Other proliferators like Iran could avail themselves for that. We're without, as the Vice President said, our major weapon. So we do need to think about this. We need options if sanctions are not immediately available to us. And frankly, I think we need more information. I'm sure Ash will go into us in greater detail about the trajectory of that missile. Because you'll notice from the media report, they had a different trajectory than the report just given to us by the Deputy National Security Advisor. Finally, Eric. Uh, just two recommendations. First, diplomatic. Ash and I obviously uh, need to get on the phone with our Chinese counterparts. I'm going to call the state counselor who reports directly to Xi Jinping, Yang Yirshu. We've already had an emergency, as you know, UN Security Council meeting. We did that, Madam Vice President, within three hours uh, of, our, of our receipt of the news of this. We got it on the red phone. I've talked to the foreign ministers of Japan, South Korea, Australia, and I've talked to Ursula von der Leyen. Uh, the new foreign policy chief of the European Union, they're with us in applying necessary economic leverage and political leverage to get the attention of the Chinese. Final point, I hope uh, colleagues will not uh, mind that I did call the president this morning. I felt that he uh, needed uh, our advice, and I gave him a sense of what we're doing diplomatically. Now, as you know, he's at his family home in Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, and because he's been so successful, actually, because the he's president's been, on the road with her entourage on Air Force One. Because, <laughs> uh, Eric, you know, I have high regard for you, but you seem to be confused I about the identity. I don't think the president's <laughs> gender is remotely the, relevant here. <laughs> um, because the president has been so successful in revitalizing our infrastructure and developing a bullet train for the Northeast Corridor. He'll be here in 45 minutes. Thank you. Okay, we'll save domestic <laughs> issues for a later date. Um, Secretary Summers, you've heard all of the things that the Secretary of State has done to get options in motion. Um, Mr. Secretary, with all due respect, if you're going to speak to the President in the future, if you could let me know, that will help us run a better process. Secretary Summers, what are your thoughts on the efficacy of sanctions and the options that we may have available? And just how much leverage do we have over the North Koreans right now? I wish I had uh, better news. Fundamentally, our ability to sanction North Korea in a devastating way depends upon Chinese cooperation. If goods can be imported into China and taken across the border from China to North Korea, North Korea has a lifeline. That was true before the digital yuan 
was invented, and that is true now in the presence of the digital yuan. Our ability to lever North Korean sanctions is almost wholly dependent on the degree to which we can achieve cooperation with the Chinese. And so I believe our strategy needs to focus on what we can work out with uh, the Chinese in this matter. The Vice President is right. We have terrible problems with the Chinese. They have been provocative across many spheres, from the economic to the technological to the human rights to cheating at the Olympics. Um, that would have been unimaginable even a few years ago. But we also have important areas of mutual uh, interest. They do not want to see a flourishing drug trade sponsored by North Korea. It is their machinery that is closest to the North Korean uh, border and is at greatest risk from North Korean cyber attack. We need to formulate a strategy that is directed at achieving cooperation with China. We will not successfully starve North Korea economically without the cooperation of China, and certainly not if it is their objective to see us fail in that objective. And it is that central reality that needs to shape our response in designing a sanctions regime, I would submit. Okay, thank you, Secretary Summers. Secretary Carter, you've always been a little more hawkish on the Chinese than any Secretary of the Treasury. So I'm hoping uh, with all the experience you have dealing with the North Koreans that you have a little bit better news for us in terms of our response options and our current posture as it relates to the most recent test. Well, let me associate. And, and first of all, and most importantly, what does this actually mean that they have tested a missile with that range and an RV? Is this something Americans should lose sleep well, over? Well, what they've done is fly one missile towards Guam for about a third of the distance that it would take to get to the west coast of the United States. Not that it's not the same as proving you can do it. Um, but it comes, it shows that they will, what we've always known for quite some time, will eventually get there if left to uh, follow their own uh, path. And I, I, you know, I, I appreciate that the meeting is focused on economics, and I think that's really where it should be. But let me just remind you so that you can remind the, the president where we stand. Um, if North Korea does proceed, it will proceed steadily but slowly to deploy missiles that are capable of reaching the United States with a nuclear warhead. We have anticipated that for quite some time. And by the way, Guam also. Uh, and we have missile defenses, and um, I'm reasonably confident in their capabilities against small numbers of North Korean ICBMs. So we are not completely um, uh, exposed. And um, you might also remind the president that he doesn't need to, he or she doesn't need to at, um, a change uh, his or, or well, his 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 behavior. I won't need to disturb him at Mar-a-Lago um, <laughs> with an abrupt was, phone call just to complete the picture here. Um, because, and I, this is important because this is a no kidding thing. This 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 develops in in not in three days waiting for a meeting and three hours waiting for a phone call, uh, but in three minutes and. Uh, it's within a very few minutes that we need to commit those interceptors. That is a decision that the president has not reserved to himself, yes. as he has reserved the decision to use nuclear 
weapons in retaliation for a North Korean strike. That is a decision he has reserved to himself and is not even delegated to me. He has delegated the authority to launch interceptor missiles to me right. um, because that's a much lower risk thing to do because they won't, they, they can't do anything except fly up in space and blow up in, in space. And I have in turn delegated that to the commander of Northern uh, command and they wait minute by minute with authority to do that. I only say that because I don't want the president to be concerned that this has to change the alert status that that he or she uh, themselves needs to right. to And so is that the, the the bottom line remains that so you wouldn't say that you've changed your estimate on the intent no, of the I North mean, Koreans to conduct a strike against the United States even though their capability may No, we knew we'd, we'd get there. It certainly is an unfortunate event, but okay. militarily it doesn't change things abruptly right. overnight for us. Fortunately, I also will remind you that if it came to war on the Korean Peninsula, that is an intensity of violence of the kind the world has not seen since the last Korean War. And um, so that is a serious business. We're ready for that too. We will destroy the North Korean armed forces and we'll destroy the Pyongyang regime. Of that I'm certain, but that is a very, very ugly war. So all these are unpleasant. Um, alternatives, which is why we've worked so hard at diplomacy and use the weapon of sanctions. And to the extent, as the Secretary of Treasury notes, um, that weapon is undermined by this Chinese development, if indeed it actually uh, is, then we're more reliant than we have ever been on not our coercive power through SWIFT, but our persuasive power with the Chinese. And the Secretary of Treasury has already m m made that clear. He prefaced his remarks by saying he has bad news. I guess I have worse news, which is uh, that we have 30 years of history of, persu of not persuading the Chinese right. to use their leverage. Uh, and that seems like economic or otherwise against uh, North Korea. And the situation of having a, a digital currency doesn't really change that all that much. The Chinese have never really done that much um, at patrolling uh, black market kind of stuff. Right. Digital currency makes it marginally more uh, possible, but it doesn't change the game entirely. So we continue to have a bad hand. I don't. I wouldn't say it is dramatically changed. Okay. So that is the perfect transition to the number two item on the agenda, which is now talking about the digital yuan and may, what it may mean to our ability to leverage the North Koreans to inhibit them from making progress over the next six to nine months so that they don't have that capability in the best case to uh, hit the United States, at least on the West Coast. So what I'd like to do now, because we have the response options set for normal missile tests, is turn over to uh, the DNI first. Uh, and actually, excuse me, I'm gonna turn it over to our brand new digital currency czar. This is Neha Narula. You know, the president has identified this being as forward looking as she is in technology and digital currencies as a priority for the administration, took the initiative to appoint a digital currency czar known hereforth as the crypto czar. <laughs> Could you tell us a little bit, Neha? Can I just say, can I just, uh, I want to just be very clear. Yes, and she works all, for the president. With Secretary all the Sanders. principles here that while we at the Treasury Department, of course, welcome uh, the existence of a currency czar, and we <laughs> very much yes. believe in the importance of coordination right. uh, in this area. The preparation, the printing, the regulating, the managing of all U.S. currency yes. is, according to the Constitution, Correct. The prerogative yes. of yes. The Treasury Secretary Department. Summers, all those and as we perform that function, traditional we will be delighted functions. to work uh, <laughs> with uh, the that's, currency official who has been appointed. That's great. Um, because we need someone who knows about these current issues and new technology, the president hired Neha. Neha, go ahead. Could you talk to us a little bit about what the digital yuan means? And in particular, um, how could the North Koreans be using this to support their missile programs and their nuclear programs? Well, well thank you very much. And, um, you know, Secretary, 
it's, it's always great to talk to you about currency, and uh, you know, you bring up the printing a lot. Um, so the president really, I think, um, was really very forward-looking in deciding to create this position and realizing that the fundamental nature of money is really changing. It's becoming digital. It's, it's, uh, it's no longer the paper bills, the coins, the, even the traditional banking system that we've had. We've seen surface something completely different. And so when it comes to the digital one, um, you know, this has been in the works for quite a while, even back when I was, I was working at MIT. I know that, that China has been pushing this forward. Um, and so I can say that it was a great move to, to start to raise this role and to raise this concern and to bring, bring together all the experts that are spread across various government agencies. Now, when it comes to the way that North Korea can use digital currency, over the past few years, they've been doing uh, all sorts of things to bolster their economy with digital currency. Sending these missiles requires money, um, and they have been using cyber attacks across cryptocurrency exchanges, banks, uh, and the SWIFT system in order to raise money in order to conduct these attacks. Some reports say on the order of $2 billion that they've been able to procure. So really, uh, the WAN is just the latest in this new way of uh, giving the North Koreans access to money that um, they were trying to get access to before. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so, uh, Gary, you're the assistant to the president for economic policy, have a deep background in digital currencies as well. One of the questions that the president has is, can we definitively say that the Chinese have the ability to see these yuan transactions that the North Koreans are using? And is it the Chinese government or is it Chinese banks? How much visibility will we have in the transactions and like Eric, this? Um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we have to get at some point in this meeting to a report from these people or Treasury on whether we should have this capacity now or in the future. That's right. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. We're going to try to avoid some of the tendencies of the Obama administration and not just focus on the problem for the entire PC, but get to options later on. So, <laughs> Gary, go ahead. Um, I want to say first what it, an honor it is to serve with the Secretary again. I served with him once uh, before. Um, I do think that the digital yuan is totally transparent to the Chinese government. People's Bank of China initiated this several years ago, uh, basically to compete in their domestic payment space with two big tech companies, Alibaba with Alipay, Intention with WeChat Pay. It was kind of a domestic-inspired thing. You might remember Facebook was also kicking around a digital currency caught. We'll talk Labor. a little bit more about that later, yes. But uh, they absolutely, the Chinese government, has transparency into it. With all respect, Secretary, though, uh, sorry, I think... I don't mean to interrupt. Do you mean therefore that they did not have transparency into Alipay? I think that the transparency into the digital yuan is higher. I do think, Mr. Secretary, they have transparency when they wish to have it into Alipay. But last year, they actually made Alipay wallets and WeChat Pay wallets digital yuan wallets. So now it's all a unified Based on the, I'm sorry, I just don't understand. Based on the fact that these people, if we go to China for 45 minutes, get total transparency into every bit of technology we've ever possessed in our lives. <laughs> I find it inconceivable that they did not previously have complete yeah. transparency with respect to anything that any Chinese company or enterprise and was that, doing. That's exactly the question. First, right. we're hoping you take your burner phone when you go to China. But for Gary, so it is the case, just to confirm what the Secretary of Defense and Treasury is saying, the Chinese would have visibility into these they, transactions. They, they, they absolutely and, would. And is it that they know what they're seeing they, when they the Chinese are transacting, the, the North Koreans are the transacting? The only difference, with all respect, Mr. Secretary, is Alipay and WeChat Pay are used in the retail space, and Secretary of the Treasury is absolutely right. They have that visibility. But now it's a third party, a country, North Korea, using that along with a new system called a cross-border payment system, right. a CIPS, which is competing with SWIFT. So they have a new messaging system mm -hmm. that they stood up in 2016, as you recall. Yes. And that new messaging system, I don't think it will undermine the role of the U.S. dollar in international commerce, but it absolutely 
puts to bed that SWIFT cannot be used as an right. instrument of So this is policy. a really important fact, excuse me, Madam Vice President, that we're going to examine a little bit later on. But with that, Madam Vice President, go yes, ahead. Yes, thank you for yielding the floor. Of course, Madam. <laughs> um, I'd like to know about the CIPEX, this basically, am I correct in understanding that it is the Chinese equivalent to SWIFT? They, they in fact, and, they, in fact uh, they, they actually took the software from SWIFT with a memorandum of understanding. They, they took that software and created their own messaging system. And are there other countries that are using it or might potentially use it? And is there a tipping point at which point the global economy will be, in fact, bifurcated? Again, I think it, we're decades away from China developing the robust capital markets and the legal systems to compete with the U.S. dollar. But to your question, yes, other countries have adopted the CIPS. Russia has back in 2019. They entered into a bunch of agreements. Um, and so they're moving uh, value, money, outside of the SWIFT system. And more and more, all respect to the State Department, we won't be able to use SWIFT uh, as we, we've sort of weaponized SWIFT, but we won't be able to use it that much longer. As always, Madam Vice President, excellent question. And we're going to continue running a good process, just like a good Deputy National Security Advisor in the Bush administration would. Um, <laughs> for the Director of National Intelligence now, the question is, does the U.S. ability to enforce sanctions on North Korea become impacted when we know the North Koreans are moving towards a digital yuan? They're using that, maybe moving, moving off SWIFT. What's your bottom line assessment from the DNI on the enforceability and usefulness leverage of sanctions? Well, I think it's challenging, um, but not impossible. Um, and when I think about sanctions enforcement, I think about it at a tactical level and a strategic level. And I think at the tactical level, it really depends on what information we have. And we've had some success um, going after um, digital currency efforts by other countries like Iran by gathering enough information about digital IP addresses related to the currencies. Whether we can do that here, I can't make any promises. We've been obviously hard at work trying to gather any information we have that we could be you know, putting to use in that kind of a strategy, and it's, it's very challenging. But at a strategic level, I wanted to, to kind of go back to Secretary Summers' remarks, and I completely agree that, that really the cooperation with China is the key here. But what we've talked about so far, I think, is the Chinese government, and there's another actor involved here, with it, which are the Chinese commercial banks. That, as I understand it, the way the digital currency is structured, Chinese commercial banks are in the middle of it, and they have an interest in doing business in the United States. And so at some point, we need to think about what kind of pressure and other tools can we use um, to focus on those banks and their interests in the United States. And that's where we have to decide what appetite do we have, how much pressure do we want to put on them, and um, how would we approach it. But I think a strategy could be developed around those particular banks. Wait, 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 wait. just, just one President, thing here. I'm sorry. Madam Go Vice ahead. President. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> um, do those banks, Chinese banks, have any ability to make independent decisions if the Chinese government is telling them that they need to distribute this digital yuan? I mean, is pressure on those individual banks of any value? Well, I think they'd have to make a decision about whether they want to give up completely business in the United States. And they may, make, may choose or may be forced to make that choice, but it's not what we've seen them do in the past. Okay. The, Wait, again, I, I excellent point. We want to keep in mind points of leverage we have in order to coerce or achieve our interests. So we're going to mark that down. Secretary Summers, please. I think we've got to get a couple things straight. First, as the President pointed out in her campaign, the degree of separation between U.S. banks and the U.S. government is less than immense with the tendency for the U.S. government historically to follow the instincts of U.S. banks. So are you and saying U.S. banks are analogous to Chinese no, banks? No, I'm not. In I'm saying that in government? China, the banks and the government are one, and the banks will do what the government wants it to, and the Vice President is entirely right, and we can think of ourselves as dealing with one decision maker, which is the Chinese government. That's, point. That's uh, the first uh, point. The second point is, Respectfully, I don't think it matters one whit just what the Chinese government can see of any kind of yuan system. Anything that's got to do with the yuan, the Chinese government are going to see plenty easily. The threat, I mean, the challenge here is that we have had what, if you step back from the point of view of the rest of the world, is a kind of remarkable power. 
which is that if somebody in Vietnam wants to pay somebody in Laos, and we're no, no one American is within 10,000 miles of the thing, we've somehow had an ability to get involved and disrupt that. And we are in danger yes. of losing that. Yes. By the way, if we have our own digital wand, that won't do any digital dollar, digital anything, Venmo, national Venmo, whatever the hell it is, <laughs> it will do nothing to interfere one whit with the ability of others. So we yes. have a choice. Yes. We can, and I yield to my national security colleagues here, we can try to apply such severe threats to the Chinese that they're not going to try to establish some kind of Venmo that will enable people in Asia to trade with each other. We can try that. Yeah. I suspect we'd have to bring enormous coercive pressure to get them to accept that, that it would be a huge loss of face for them if they did accept it, and that the risk of being that confrontational with them would surely destroy any chance that they would cooperate with us on North Korea, and quite yeah. likely would set us irrevocably on the path that the vice president fears towards an entirely splintered world. Yeah. Yeah. And, Excellent and, points. And just, and just to remind you, over the last two years, we've seen a transition to those Chinese payment platforms based on some of the social media communication platforms that they developed in the past. Mark, I'm first going to go to the point Secretary point. of Defense with all due respect, and then I want to get the perspective of our U.S. ambassador to China is for some reason in person here today in the situation. <laughs> You have to take full advantage of that. Sorry. Okay, yes, go ahead. You, you, as Secretary so of State, you do get to let, go before let, the let, ambassador. Let's try to, Secretary Carter, Let's yes. try to pull some of these things together uh, for the president. I, I think what we're all hearing here is that internally this uh, digital currency doesn't make any difference in China, or material. It may add some convenience to a repressive machinery. Uh, that pre-existed, and with res but so internally it doesn't matter much. Externally, the external world is in play, uh, and there it is having a what to me is an undeserved effect of uh, weakening, of, of increasing the Chinese economic power and weakening our own economic power. I say it unnecessary because I don't think there's anything logical that connects a digital currency to the replacement of us in the SWIFT system, but there is something psychological and we have to take that seriously and counter it. And I think that uh, the way of doing that, or a, a, an important way of doing that, is not to confront the Chinese and so forth, but I, I, I I, I think we have to stick up for the integrity of the system that we have backed right. for a long time. I think much of the world's economy supports that for a very good reason. There's no particular reason for them to go uh, for the Chinese alternative now. And remember, the Chinese get a lot of mileage out of false brands. Uh, they do with the Belt and Road. This is the country that builds cities with no people in them. Uh, and they're capable of building citizens with no followers in them as well. So I think we have to get in the external game and combat this because this is a tool and this is an example of the, f the fact that even though it's not a world split in two, as the Secretary of the Treasury rightly uh, points out, that's not entirely our choice. China's half of Asia, we want the other half with us and not if it comes to that, and at least not aligned against us. We want the rest of the world that way, and we need to play the game that's on the, on the field. And that is a reason why I think that we need to think about our own counter moves in this yes. area, and the President does, and we also need to do something to kind of debunk the momentum that this thing's getting. Right. Uh, I remember one of my Chinese. professors at the Kennedy School said, you can't go on defense unless you have offense. So we're transitioning out to the Secretary of State very quickly, only because the Vice President and I have a drop dead to talk to the President. 
uh, within one hour, and we need to make sure that we get all through this. So, well, Mr. Secretary, and then I'm going to go to Ambassador Vermont. I certainly would like to be part of that phone call. Um, at this time, it's just going to be tell you why. the Vice President and, and I, tell you but why. since you've already been making your Eric, direct calls to the why. President. <laughs> because, <laughs> and, and, I, and rightly so, as the vicar of uh, the President's foreign policy. That's right. We're better as a team uh, if we work together, Mr. Secretary. Look, we're in, we're in real jeopardy here. And it seems to me we've got to push through a lot of this analysis towards tactics right now and recommendations. The president's going to have to approach Xi Jinping. We're in jeopardy because every previous president, the last three, have had two things going for him. The right. ability to threaten force against North Korea, yes. and let the Chinese know that, and sanctions, implement them. If sanctions is off the table temporarily, we've got to find other pressure points on the Chinese leadership. I don't know if it's the commercial banks. We're going to have to think through this. But the president, we can set up the calls. And we can get the Japanese and South Koreans to be involved, but the president's going to have to make this case. So That sounds good. My, my recommendation is to when we get to the options part of the agenda, we'll work through those, we'll capture those, we'll uh, pass those on to the president, and then give you the thumbs up to do that. Ambassador Verma, you're there in China. Talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing, the Chinese strategic perspective on digital currency, their payment platforms, what they're doing in fintech. How does this all look from the strategic perspective and the tie to North Korea? Yeah, no, I, I appreciate being here. Uh, as you know, I'm not a career diplomat. I am a um, banker and industrialist by, uh, by training. And I have so you should been, know a lot about this, hopefully. And I have been uh, enormously successful in the, in the private sector. <laughs> So um, it should not surprise you that I've been enormously successful in Beijing. In fact, <laughs> since I've been on the ground, relations have never been stronger between uh, the U.S. and China. Uh, and these are interesting meetings that you, that you have here. If I was to do this in my business, we would have um, gone under years ago to talk this much. So, um, you can only hope to be National Security Advisor someday. Yeah. So um, look, I think, we're on a, I think we're on a dangerous course here because the choices uh, that I hear are very much headed towards uh, confrontation. And I would encourage this team to think more about cooperation. And I associate myself with what the Secretary of Treasury has said. And I think we should proceed with great caution, try to de-escalate. And as you said, rightly, there is a financial technology revolution taking place, and we are about to miss it. And we can fault the Chinese for getting there ahead of us, but we could also try to partner with them and join them in some way. And I'll just remind you, Christine Lagarde said, we should consider the possibility of rolling out a digital currency. Mark Carney said we should consider joining forces to create a virtual currency. We're upset in this room because they got there ahead of us. My recommendation is that we not try to quash this effort, but we in fact try to get on board and even look for ways to partner with the Chinese government. That's the best way to ensure we maintain good relations and get the leverage we need on the North Korea question. This is exactly what I committed to the president when I called her on my cell phone the other day from a cafe <laughs> in Beijing. <laughs> she, was, she was coming in so loud and clear I had to hold the handset away from my uh, face. And I believe this is the best way forward. Okay, uh, Mr. Ambassador, you sound like you may have already spent too much time in China. Breaking news out of Brussels this evening. A cyber attack on SWIFT the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunication has resulted in the theft of $3 billion from commercial banks based in Germany, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE. SWIFT is a global messaging system which banks use to share payments instructions. Early reports suggest that the attackers exploited vulnerabilities to gain control of member banks' legitimate SWIFT credentials. Attackers used those credentials to send SWIFT funds transfer requests to other banks, which, trusting the messages to be legitimate, then sent the funds to accounts controlled by the attackers. These are the latest in a string of attacks on the SWIFT network, including the high-profile 2016 attack that resulted in a massive theft from the Bangladesh Central Bank. Authorities say it is too early to tell who perpetrated the attack, and investigations are ongoing. For more on this, we go live to Brussels. Okay, 
Uh, we have just got new information and intelligence uh, about the SWIFT attack. We had preliminary information, as you all know, from your briefings prior to the meeting. Uh, but at this point, I would like to turn it over to the Deputy National Security Advisor to provide you more information about what we just have received in terms of intelligence about this attack. Thank you. Uh, we have confirmed a cyber attack on SWIFT, uh, which has resulted in the theft of $3 billion from commercial banks based in Germany, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE. Our intelligence agencies assess with moderate confidence that North Korea is behind the attack, potentially with an aim to drive more users to the digital yuan system. At the broader strategic level, the PBOC has been presenting its digital currency infrastructure as an alternative to SWIFT, referring to the traditional payment system as outdated and highly vulnerable to security threats. Over two years ago, in 2019, PBOC's Deputy Director of Payments said, the digital yuan is open for external connection. We are developing it for our trade partners if they want to join. This work is already ongoing and test connections already exist. Chinese authorities claim that the digital yuan infrastructure is fully portable. Countries can create different instances of the system, selecting their own banks and payments providers as network participants and releasing digital forms of their local currencies. In Russia, for example, the central bank, as well as the largest Russian commercial banks, Sparebank, VTC, uh, VTB, excuse me, Gazprom Bank, and so on, could be added as nodes to create a Russian instance with a digital ruble. All nodes within the system would then be able to clear and settle payments in real time, including cross-border transactions. We have been tracking that Russia, Turkey, and Pakistan have been in talks with the Chinese to develop uh, this system and adopt their competing system for their own digital currencies over the past year. We don't yet know if the three impacted countries, Germany, Saudi Arabia, and UAE, will also consider connecting to the Chinese system. So it's as if the North Koreans were reading the tea leaves on some of the things that you had made comments about regarding the vulnerability of the SWIFT system, our use of it in the past, perhaps driving others there. So I'd like to ask the DNI again, um, how is the SWIFT system important to U.S. national security interests? Let's just get back at that. And then what we're going to do is we're going to move right to the options generation stage, what to do about this. Will this hack on SWIFT? drive more of these countries to a swift alternative, instances of the Chinese system. What should we do about that? How does that limit our leverage? But let's start with the DNI. What's your assessment of what this attack could do to driving other towards SWIFT, and how much does that matter? Um, <clears throat> let's just remember SWIFT's a messaging system. So they don't, they're not a bank. They don't extend credit. They don't provide financial services. Their function is really to provide the language that banks use to move money around the world. They are by far the largest provider of that language, even if there is a competitor out there. So at this point, we don't have a bifurcation. Could a breach or additional breaches drive people out of SWIFT? Absolutely. Um, but we're also at risk of doing that every time we use SWIFT to cut off banks, to weaponize SWIFT, as you've mentioned. It, it provides an incentive for the creation of these other, other systems. I think SWIFT's important because it is a standardized messaging system. They require robust information attached to these transactions. I think the United States, um, you know, we, we agree that, that that's very necessary to help banks detect illicit activity, so that, that is a, a, an attribute of SWIFT. And we also have, have had some important programs with SWIFT that gave us information to support investigations, such as the terrorist financing tracking program, which we've, we, we use with SWIFT to investigate terrorist financing. So it's an important um, platform right. for us. Okay. Could I um, yes, ask Madam a Vice question President. before we move to options? Sure. Uh, maybe for the DNI or possibly for the Deputy National Security Advisor. We've been talking about cooperating with China in the face of these challenges and threats, and now we hear of this attack. Is it conceivable that North Korea could organize this attack without the assistance of the Chinese? Or should we see this for what it probably is, which is a Chinese attack on the SWIFT system? I think either possibilities are, are, it, are valid. But the Chinese certainly have an interest in, in that type of interest. But as state. you know, Madam Vice President, the North Korean cyber operators and cyber army has been very active in attacking the SWIFT system. As mentioned in your intelligence reports, the attack on SWIFT at the Bangladeshi Central Bank almost resulted in the theft of a billion dollars, if not for very small mistakes that the North Korean cyber operators made in 
mistyping data entries going to the New York Fed. This is something that they've been very active in doing, hitting crypto banks. So you can see why it's in the interest of both the North Koreans to drive people to the Chinese alternative and probably coincidentally in the Chinese interest that that happens. Although it seems from my personal perspective, unlikely the Chinese would be involved in an attack like this against someone like the Saudis or the Germans. Uh, but I don't know if you agree with that assessment. Yeah, I agree. And as we said, we assess with medium confidence that it was the North Koreans. The, um, the cyber attack is very similar to the one that we saw in, uh, in the Bangladesh attack. Right. So at this point, I was just going to, we're going to move to the options generation stage because of the call that we have with the president, uh, Madam Vice President. Where I'd like to start um, is with our digital currencies are. Uh, and let's talk about the idea that some of the members of the cabinet have already proposed is that we need an alternative. We need our, our own option as a digital currency. Um, as you know, way back in 2019, Facebook proposed this crazy idea of Libra uh, and that possibly being the alternative of a cryptocurrency backed by US dollars and a basket of other currencies, including the yuan. Could you talk to us a little bit about that? Is, is Libra the answer in the state that it is right now? And what should the US do from your perspective? Well, what I'm a little bit worried about right now is what I'm hearing around this table is that everyone's OK with the status quo. And I think you know, given what we've just seen happening with SWIFT, we have to come to terms with the fact that US electronic transaction systems have not evolved fast enough to keep pace with the demand for retail online digital payments and more sophisticated types of financial transactions. And they also haven't evolved fast enough to, say, to stay secure in this increasingly digital world where uh, you know, our enemy's cyber tactics are becoming more and more advanced. So the old system just isn't cutting it anymore. And unfortunately, the trajectory of that is that it's just going to keep on getting worse and worse and worse. And so, yes, we see China with the yuan. But you know, the competitiveness of the US dollar is a matter of national security. And we have to take this seriously and continue to innovate. Today, in 2021, we are still in a place where the US dollar is the world's reserve currency. Uh, the US dollar has incredible importance, and it allows us to enact monetary policy and to uh, weaponize SWIFT, as, as Gary put it. However, that could change if suddenly another currency becomes more interesting and more viable. So we have to keep pace with this innovation. Okay. So to summarize Libra and, uh, and how it worked back in 2019, it's a basket of bank deposits and other short-term government securities. It's stable. It's governed by something called the Libra Association, which is a consortium of private companies across a certain number, yes. There's still a few left, fortunately. I'm going to ask Facebook. Secretary Carter later how much he trusts Mark Zuckerberg uh, <laughs> handling the US equivalent of a digital currency. Well, look, go ahead. I will say I agree with the Secretary. Um, so, you know, it, it does not make sense to, uh, to put our nation's transaction systems in the hands of a private company. However, that does not mean that we should not move forward and that we should not consider a public-private partnership in order to innovate, in order to get our transaction systems up to the level where they can compete on the global stage. Have any of you actually used WeChat or Alipay? They're amazing. You can pay for everything. It's seamless. It's easy. You can make micropayments. We just don't have that. In 2021, in the United States, we are lagging behind. You sound like you've been hanging out with our ambassador uh, quite a bit over <laughs> in China. Um, and, and very quickly, just so I can get to the Secretary of the Treasury and the Secretary of Defense. So, so I think we do need to explore this public-private partnership. Um, one thing that is of the utmost importance is thinking about privacy. And this is something that Libra really got wrong. Everything is out in the open. Everything is public, all transactions. They don't put actual user identities out there on the blockchain. They use encoded numbers instead. But that is easily traceable, easily mineable. And I think it really speaks to you know who originated this design, didn't take privacy 
very seriously. Now, you might say, hey, we would like to use these transaction systems in order to find illicit activity, to find criminals. However, I think that that can be done while considering privacy and security. We went through a similar debate around HTTPS, which is the protocol that is used to secure today's web. Now, at the time, it seemed inconceivable to allow user web activity to be encrypted and outside of the surveillance apparatus. But now, 81% of government websites use HTTPS. I think we have to think about technologies like this. We have to think about privacy. And uh, we need a public-private partnership in the spirit of what we did with ARPANET and the internet in order to move this forward. OK. Are Sounds like one distinct option. Yes, are you Go suggesting ahead. that we can't do this alone as the U.S. government, that we don't have the ability? That's Perhaps exactly the question we should ask the, the Secretary of the Treasury. Yes, the Secretary and the of the Treasury. Treasury. Secretary Summers, does Treasury have the capability and technical know-how to successfully implement a digital dollar? Let me just say, this is not a Kennedy School exercise for us. That's right. We've got Thank a God. staff <laughs> of 40 people who've been working on this for a long time, who have extensive experience with the relevant interconnections. Okay. So just First to clarify, thing, no, is the, answer, not, the answer is yes? Uh, the, answer, the answer is that the SWIFT system is an interbank system. You cannot meaningfully work on an interbank system without working with the private sector. And I spoke with Jamie uh, Diamond three months ago. There's a team of people that he's pulled together from the six major uh, financial institutions in the United States, along with a number of Larry Fink and a number of the asset managers who are working with an interagency team at the Fed, at the Treasury, at the controller of uh, the currency to get this right. We, we, right now, we have one network that doesn't work very well. The worst idea in the world would be to now try to have two, SWIFT and some other separate cyber project. We have this under control. We've got a public sector-led team with the relevant private sector actors that is hardening SWIFT. And a hard SWIFT that will be secure has to be our first priority. Okay. We don't need to worry about the dollar. Look. Let's, let's be honest here in uh, the situation uh, room. Europe's a museum, Japan's a nursing home, and China's a jail. And we don't need to worry about those currencies being some kind of major threat to us. Okay, and I, I know the president threat, will press me on this. Threat, when, when can we make this happen? If it's a real option, we have we'll to have think hard, about implementation. We will have a new hardened currency, swift system, ready to roll out six months uh, from uh, today. today. Are you we willing? Will have to, it. Are you willing to, to bet your job on it? I'm willing to. You know I'm our president was. So are you bill, willing to bet your job on it? That we will have uh, such a system in place. Okay. Frankly, there is one thing that we will need. Um, our efforts have been substantially impaired by the currency czars calling and giving contradictory instructions uh -huh. to yeah. the people we're speaking with. And so if you give us responsibility, we'll deliver. Um, if the right currency now, czar is doing as, as it, always, then we'll see what with happens. With all due respect, Mr. Secretary, the White House is in charge. And as a direct staffer to the president, then we'll, we'll let keep the it currency that way. Czar can try, the currency czar can, and our Kennedy School friends right. it's a good um, team spirit, Mr. Can Secretary. Try Thank to, you very much. Uh, can try to deliver right. this currency. Um, so we, we have one of the options on the table is to develop a U.S. version of digital currency, either possibly alone, although that sounds hard, or as a public-private par partnership. I want to think about other options, though, to try to get at the issue of North Korea. Let's not forget what it is we're trying to focus on here and not just the shiny ball of a digital currency. Can Mr. I, Secretary, do you have a, a thought on that? Of course. Question, which yes. is, uh, 
Secretary Summers, are you suggesting that the U.S. create our own digital currency or just that we work on SWIFT, we stick to our current system, but make SWIFT less vulnerable to cyber threats? We need to make a secure SWIFT. Look, SWIFT is digital. It's all binary. It's all uh, electronic uh, communication. So there's a question about what the definition, what we mean uh, by that. But my proposal is that we harden SWIFT that we commit with respect to avoiding what other c countries see as abuse of SWIFT, and that we make clear that where there are SWIFT transactions involving North Korea or involving other rogue nations, we will use the leverage associated with SWIFT. But secondary sanctions on those who are engaged in transactions and commerce that does not involve rogue nations, we will not uh, seek uh, to interfere. Okay. Unless we make a pledge of that kind, that sounds we are like, likely to lose the integrity so of SWIFT. If I can try to clarify real quick, on. that sounds like a major policy change for the U.S. government that we're going to commit to not implementing secondary sanctions. So we'll propose that to the President from the Secretary of Treasury. Hardening SWIFT, but that is different than the proposal from our currency czar on proposing a digital currency as a joint public partnership. So we have three distinct options right now. At this point, I'd like to turn to the Secretary of State, if I could, Mr. Secretary. Thank you very much. From a diplomatic perspective, uh, Eric, we need to form a coalition. Uh, the Japanese and South Koreans need to be part. This is on North Korea and on China. Japanese and South Koreans have to be charter members and the European Union. The big mistake that President Trump made after his ninth individual meeting with Kim Jong-un, which took place in Stockholm, is he got nothing. And the EU is not a competitor. The EU is our strongest global partner. Bring the EU into that, number one. Number two, in the short term, you do have a lot of Southeast Asian countries who are attracted by this Chinese central bank uh, digital currency. We need a major campaign. I think it's state treasury led to go around to those capitals and convince them this is not in their interest. I think we can convince Pakistan and Turkey. Can I, can I push you to, on that? Sorry yeah. to interrupt, Mr. Secretary. We convince them, but, but what are we offering? The Chinese are bringing investment. They're bringing the Belt and Road. They're offering better technology in terms of the competitive system to SWIFT. And what do, what do we bring and to convince them of that? Is, is it just you're very persuasive and the ambassador? Yeah. How are we going to do that? Yeah. And the problem is that President Trump did nothing right. for years on this. So we've got to Luckily, build. that's in the past. Looking can, forward, how do, we, how do we convince them? We've got to take the BUILD Act, which was actually one of the best things the Trump administration did with Congress, and we've got, to, we've got to expand that three or four times. But in the short term, it's a largely defensive uh, mission that st Treasury and state need to undertake to warn these countries of the perils. Frankly, I'd let Russia sell its future to the Chinese if that's what they want to do. It's not in the Russian national interest. Last, let me just say, I think when the President does have this phone call, it has to happen in the next 24 hours with Xi Jinping. He's got to be tough-minded. The Chinese have created a major problem for us. Ash and I have talked about it on North Korea. If the Chinese want us to go down a military options road, they've opened the door to that. Uh, we've got to convince the Chinese, and the President has to do it, to go back with us and develop some sanctions and some pressure, some leverage on North Korea. Finally, I think Larry and Gary and Neha, if you can develop some capacity in the United States to have our own uh, currency, a digital currency, that's going to give us the leverage longer term that we're going to need. Well, Mr. Secretary, if I could just say, I, I know you're my boss, and so this is um, going to be hard for me to say. You, you do report through me. I, I, I do. <laughs> and, uh, I just remind you of that, Ambassador. I, I, I will say. We, we, the, the President wanted the Ambassador at the table. Go ahead, Mr. Well, we are We are trudging down some old paths here, and we are dividing ourselves into what has become this bifurcated world that the Vice President was uh, warning about. And we tend to think of the only things that are provocative to the Chinese is our naval forces, our military exercises. But if, if we build the kind of system we're talking about and have even a stronger dollar-denominated global currency system, whether it's electronic or digital, it'll be even more provocative. And we will be in a longer death struggle with the Chinese. I would argue 
uh, that we revisit the G2 concept oh. that we had <laughs> talked about in the early days India of the Obama would cut administration. Us off the European <laughs> Union with an ambassador, you've done a great job with the cocktail parties in Beijing. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to hear from Secretary Carter. Secretary Carter, you, you always have uh, some thoughts about the Chinese well, and whether we should be concerned about provoking them. What are your I thoughts? Don't, I don't let's, it's getting too late in the meeting to offer my, uh, my own ideas or proposals. Let me try to summarize if I can so that you can help you to summarize for the president where we are. I think we had the broad proposal came in several different flavors that we can't let stand the Chinese using this currency issue as a way of making inroads into what has traditionally been a strength of ours. Um, and we had a proposal that to, 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 to counter it in some way. Replication may be a piece of a counter. Um, um, uh, it may be something involving SWIFT. Um, since one of the things we get out of our dominance of SWIFT is the ability to uh, conduct secondary sanctions, and they have been a benefit of ours, I don't want to give them up in, in, in order to preserve the very okay. system. That so it would be Joseph. fair to say that and you disagree with the Secretary of the Treasury well, about that? Well, uh, I think he too wanted to have a counter. So I think you've got a school of thought that was, we can't let this stand and we need to have a counter. And, and that counter needs to constitute, needs to be a sticking up for the American role in the international financial system. I only say that because there was another point of view, which I, I respect, though I don't share, which is a sort of a more jujitsu move where you try to counter Chinese strength by associating yourself with them. Uh, I think personally that that's a, a, a weak move and I don't recommend it, but you heard it from one of his advisors and that's what it ends up being. I think he, if I were, he, he, if I were in your shoes, I would recommend that he or she choose the first basket and ask us to come back with an elaboration, including the, 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 the resolving the okay. debate between the people who like to sign dollar bills so and the people who... Th this will be don't. one of the issues that when we have the full NSC with the president, that we will have this debate to discuss that, and we'll frame it up as an option. So that, and, and, yes, and I, I'd president. like to make sure when we have that meeting that we yes. also have it in the context of the U.S. and understanding that while we may try to shore up our financial dominance, we may also well be moving into a world where we are not financially dominant. And that is what we are discussing right here. We are in a world. We may already be in a world where we're not financially dominant, certainly not in every sphere. And so we have to think about what do we do the rest of our foreign policy tools. I'm surprised not to hear the Secretary of Defense saying he needs more support for his military, that military action is going to be one of the tools that we are going to reach for more consistently. I'll take that, I'll take that too, Madam Vice President. That heart scarcely does anything about a Chinese currency Well, I think we have to start respect. thinking big. We can't be bogged down. We well, have to think about sideways. our intelligence and, uh, operations as well. Yes, Madam Vice President. And again, just to remind the cabinet, what I really need to take to the president are options to inhibit North Korean's ability to develop their missile program over the next eight time months. So I'm going to go to the Secretary of State first. And how very have quick. we not Gary, talked go about ahead. covert action? Yes. Well, so, we, we can work on a finding. So go ahead. While, while I respect the Secretary of Treasury says we should harden SWIFT, I frankly don't think that's going to address the real policy. And we're losing the tools. Sorry to say this, Secretary uh, Carter. We're losing the tools. If we keep using SWIFT for secondary sanctions, and, and on this, been hearing that for 15 years, but what the we've got a lot of good use out of them in the meantime. So absolutely, I'm, but I'm, I think the I'm runway sorry. is shortening. I think it just, you no. just, it's just shortening, and we've seen this right here in this circumstance that North Korea could have evaded sanctions, as the Secretary of Treasury said, just because they can move things across the border. But this new competition of SWIFT is real, so I concur that we should back away from secondary sanctions. And we also have to realize we have to stiffen up other tools because SWIFT, we're in the waning days of this political, geopolitical tool. Secondly, as the currency uh, director said. Czar, uh, Czarina, excuse me. <laughs> currency director said is 
we have been leapfrogged by others, by digital currency, by digital Chinese currency. Why? Because, frankly, our central bank has been slow. And there's an appointment coming in January of 22. The president's got to decide whether to change over who's leading the Federal Reserve, and whether we need some new leadership there that can move us both domestically and internationally so that we can really be competing actively that our U.S. currency system, it's, it's under the Secretary of Treasury, but the Federal Reserve runs our payment system. Right. And I think we need to move that Federal Reserve into the modern era. Okay. So those would be my recommendations. Right. So I'm going to go to the Director of National Intelligence, and then just to give you a heads up, I'm going to go to each of the primary cabinet members, and of course you, Madam Vice President, for your final thoughts that we'll report back to the President, but we have a call in about 10 minutes, so we're going to have to wrap it up quickly. I just wanted to add, Deanna, I, please. I think we should be creating, as an offensive move, a, a digital currency, and, and that's what is going to sort of replace the Chinese currency. But I also agree with you, um, Secretary of State, that we should be having a, a joint delegation, a Treasury of State delegation, and the DNI would love to be part of that Absolutely. delegation um, to go and raise concerns about um, the Chinese digital currency and the types of activities it's being used for. Um, I think people have to be confronted with that, including private sector actors. I, I disagree with the Secretary of the Treasury about the importance of the private sector sort of awareness of that in this instance, and I think that's what we should be leading with. So the DNI will collect all the information we have about how this currency has been used, and we want to bring that to light to the people that we're talking to. Okay, great. Madam Vice President, would you like to go first or in I'd conclusion like have, after hearing everyone else's comments? I'd like to have comments? the last word. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Mr. Secretary, Secretary Carter, I'm going to start with you first. What are your, your final one-minute thoughts for the president? Before I, we I, call? I, I think it's a, on the North Korea subject. Yes. Uh, it, it, it's all been said. It's been summed up by the Secretary of State. That is okay. our best diplomatic move. The military moves remain what they are. They are very undesirable. Success in the digital on the diplomatic side does, as it always has, hinge upon China, which is another reason to make a deft move with respect to China uh, in this other area. So okay. both of these parts of, you, of today's meeting go back to China, and to my way of thinking, they go back to a, a, a strategy not of pure um, confrontation, but of active sticking up for ourselves. And that may be in part replicating what they're doing, but it's, I don't think it can be confined okay. to that. And that's where the president ought right. to land. Secretary Summers, then I'll go to you, uh, Secretary Burns, and to the Vice President. Three pieces. We've got public sector, private sector team now working on hardening SWIFT. If there should be some digital component that's separate from the current uh, SWIFT system, that can be part of what that team works on. But we are well down the field, and we need to build on the momentum of that project. Second, we need to f enter into a different kind of dialogue with China than we've had, and I hope we'll have several principals meetings before long discussing our overall strategic relationship with China, because everything about what we're able to do with North Korea, how we're able to sanction North Korea or not sanction uh, North Korea, what we're able to do with money depends upon what we can do in our overall relationship uh, with, uh, ch with China. Third, we need a strategy now that focuses on those transactions that involve North Korea itself. And we need to mobilize every bit of electronic intelligence we have directed at using the most sophisticated techniques we have to track transactions involving North Korean entities. And with respect to those entities, we need to go after them hard. Right. And if we do that, we will have the whole world uh, with us. If we are not careful, we will alienate the whole world from using our kinds of money and drive them towards alternatives, just like with respect to weapons, with respect to sanctions, sometimes you have to be very precise 
in your targeting if you want to maximize your effectiveness. Mm -hmm. Okay, DNI Fowler, can NSA get inside the new Chinese version of SWIFT? I'm sure you can. You don't answer that here. Okay, <laughs> Secretary Burns. Eric, um, we, gave you, we gave you the three options for the, for the president, what we need to do diplomatically. I think the State and Defense Departments are united on that, and you can tell the president that. Second, the president's got to tell Xi Jinping that North Korea's nuclear weapons future is a core issue for the United States. Chinese like to talk about their core issues, Taiwan and others. This is it for us. The Chinese have created a problem for us by taking away our sanctions leverage. They need to help us resolve it. So it's a hard-nosed phone call as opposed to the suggestion made by our estimable okay. ambassador. And, and you, would, you would prep a call with the Chinese foreign minister to make sure that President Xi was ready Not for with that. a foreign minister who really doesn't have a lot of power, but with Yang Yushu, the state counselor. Okay, and and he's the Thank former you. foreign minister. Yes. Third, Jack Liu warned us in 2016 that we're over-relying on sanctions coming home to roost now. Fourth, I think where we need the boldness and the creativity is on the economic side to think about defining leverage. What's the new leverage of the United States? We've got to work on that as a cabinet. Okay, thank you. Mr. Secretary, Madam Vice President, concluding comments. Great, um, thank you for this meeting, which has been very useful. Surprisingly thought, effective. Surprisingly <laughs> effective. Um, first, on North Korea, I think Secretary Burns laid it out very clearly, a pretty straightforward path. I would like us to be in a position to be more credible when the President says to Xi Jinping that we have other tools which we would be forced to use. And so again, I would look to the Secretary of Defense for maybe something we could do to suggest that we are uh, serious about deploying other tools. On the larger issue, um, I do think that having a strategy to resuscitate our financial prowess is absolutely critical. There I take very seriously the Secretary of Treasury's suggestion about really uh, foregoing secondary sanctions. Uh, I think that's something we need to look at. At the same time, we do need to look at it, our own digital currency. Um, I'd also like us to do some contingency planning. What, how do we wield American power in a world where we are not financially dominant? I think it, we, it, we just were behind the curve on that, and I look to you as National Security Advisor to really get our government thinking about that. And in a smaller sense, we need to think about particular issues that could unfold in the days ahead. What if tomorrow, what if our next, you know, Jane Perlez and that guy, David Sanger, who I think we should get in here as to part teach. of the national yeah. security he, team. He basically yeah. sits inside the sit room and reports out anyway. So yeah, I don't okay, think well, I'm happy to hear that. I like him. Um, we need, like, what, what about in five minutes if we hear that the world is trading oil in this digital yuan? What does that do to our economy? I think we really have to ask some of these questions so we don't have to wait three or four days for you to call a meeting right. every time something important happens. Thank you. Advice taken, Madam Vice President. I know Secretary Carter will be particularly enthusiastic about two to three PCs per day for the next several weeks. It's not like he has a, a department oh, of three million people and $700 billion to run, right, Mr. Secretary? Yeah, I don't want anybody to get me wrong about the money thing, Madam <laughs> Vice President. I just wasn't prioritizing that, memory. but I'll take it. <laughs> okay, uh, so here is the way that I'm gonna summarize what I will read out to the President along with you, Madam Vice President. Um, first, uh, per the Secretary of State's recommendation that there will be a POTUS call to President Xi. We're gonna talk about new avenues for cooperation somewhat in the spirit of the ambassador from China, uh, to have them help us stop using, the, have the North Koreans stop using the digital yuan for some of theirs. Make sure they understand that if there's a threat to the United States from the North Korean missile program, and they have been part of that, knowing or otherwise, that carries grave strategic consequences for our relationship. Um, uh, the Secretary of Defense will follow up with military options that we may talk to President Xi about. Um, the Secretary of State mentioned diplomatic efforts to build up things like the BUILD Act. We'll talk to the President about that. Um, also, as we heard from the Secretary of the Treasury and our very effective new cyber currencies are, <laughs> We need a strategy to, one, modernize our SWIFT system. I think the, uh, the word was harden from cyber attack, from the North Koreans in particular. But we need to develop and present options to the president for a U.S. equivalent of a digital currency, either a private-public partnership or, if the Treasury is able to do it with the Fed, uh, something that would be a public-only option. 
and we'll have both the Secretary of the Treasury and the Crypto Czar follow up on that. Uh, and as we mentioned from the Vice President and the Secretary of State, we need a strategy to resuscitate U.S. financial prowess, I think is the way you put it, Madam Vice President, and examine this idea of secondary sanctions and whether in the overuse of them we've actually undermined our ability to use them down the road. So unless I hear otherwise from the cabinet, that's what I'll read out to the president. When we have the full NSC, you all, of course, will present your own perspective on these things. Your staffs can bring new options to the table. Please, Mr. Secretary, no calls to the president until we've had the ability to we'll meet all together. We'll be better as a team. Does that all sound fine to you? <coughs> Thank you very much. Okay, and the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Good. Now I just <laughs> Okay, great. So in the military language, you say that's end X, end of exercise, and we go back into our real world personas. So before, we're going to take some time for Q&A from the audience, and you all know how that works in the forum. Before that, though, I just wanted to say very quick thank you to, you see all of the students who are here staffing the people up at the table <laughs> over... Um, <laughs> over the last... Over the last several months, the students working with ADT have put together all of this material. And when you think about everything that you just saw in the last hour and a half, there's probably 300 hours of research, memo development, slides, getting David Sanger to do an interview, doing all of that with the support, ordering a table, getting the seal, all that. They've done a really great job. So if you could help me give uh, the students a round of applause, that would be great. Also, uh, Sarah Donahue, who is the Director of Operations for the Belfer Center, has done an amazing amount of work. Sarah, if you're here and could stand up really quick. Thank you. I mean, just finding like a red phone alone <laughs> is like, yeah, I don't know if they have still f have phones like that. Also, I just want to say a quick word. This is a lot of Aditi's ideas, and she, over the last three weeks in particular, has been working like 20 hours a day to get all put together, so yeah. good job, Aditi. Okay, here's what we want to do. Um, I know I'll get the hook from the forum staff here pretty soon, but you know how the forum works. If you have a question and you want to line up uh, where the microphones are, I don't actually see mics set. Okay, there's a mic there and there's a mic there. If you have a question, about anything that happened in the simulation, about this issue at a strategic level, please feel free to go up to the mic. And if not, then it might be one of the first forums ever where we either <laughs> wore people out or they didn't have enough advanced time for questions. No? We'll just call them. Okay. I can't see anyone else. All right, anyone with a question? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Go ahead. There's the brave soul. Go ahead. Just remember, this is how it works in the form here. Just tell us who you are, where you're from, very briefly. It's a question. That means a question mark at the end, not a paragraph in four or five sentences. Uh, my name is Noah. I found out about this on Facebook. Um, so there was a little bit of sort of interpersonal uh, uh, heated dialogue. Um, especially around like the currency czar versus the secretary of treasury. How much, <laughs> how much does that sort of happen in a situation like this and how much of it sort of hashed out before you walk into the room? Maybe, maybe I'll answer having observed and from the back seats of a lot of principal committee meetings, you'd be surprised the degree to which principals do get together but also defend their turf. So Secretary Summers was doing a good job role playing what would be perceived as a threat to Treasury's space in a way, but Neha, you know, of course, is very smart. So I, I think all of that was pretty realistic. Maybe a little hyperbole I, for I the was, dramatic I, effect, I, but I was entirely being faithful to how an actual Secretary of the Treasury would be <laughs> in terms of how they felt about this initiative. I was overdoing it in the theatrical element that in, only Larry in, Summers can <laughs> in the way I in the way I described it and stated it but the the moment when I over but the moment when I said I've talked to Jamie Dimon four months ago and we've had a team going and sought to leave the impression that the newly appointed White House czar was amateur hour that 
that basic bureaucratic strategy was an absolute standard. Yeah, but, but does not reflect anything about the true intellect and um, <laughs> capability of the cyber czar. Okay, uh, there's, there's one other question behind you and then we'll just wrap it up. Go ahead, please. Hi, uh, I have a question about the TPP, uh, Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership. I know our previous uh, administration uh, spent great effort put, uh, Put, putting that forward, but now uh, I think uh, from uh, our administration, I see lack of interest of that, and I see uh, China sees that uh, as a very good, a very big uh, threat. So I just want to see uh, what your view about that. Okay, um, Secretary Burns, why don't you take that one? Um, I think disavowing TPP at the beginning of 2017 was one of the most consequential mistakes the president has made. I think a new president whoever he or she is, uh, and if it happens, is going to have to tread a little gingerly um, because time has moved on. These countries are arranging things themselves. I think we ought to have a broad-based uh, Indo-Pacific trade strategy, We also uh, trade grouping, excuse me, because that's the way to leverage China and India, the two problems in the Indo-Pacific. We have to also be aligned with the largest economy in the world, uh, the 29 members of the EU. So I would say in a new administration, a new architecture for global trade and resuscitating the multilateral trade system is a vital step in the first few months of any administration. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. So in conclusion, remember the reason you do a simulation like this is to project forward on an issue that hasn't happened. You do some analysis, try to see where it could be, and simulate the way that people would have to generate options in response to a crisis tied to something like this. I think that has a lot to do with the new project that Aditi, uh, Larry, and Nick have put together uh, with the new economic diplomacy initiative. And, of course, what we want to do, since we're at the Kennedy School, is have students, there are so many in the audience, both understand an issue in which they could have impact down the road, but also get a little glimpse of professional skills by people who literally have been the Secretary of the Treasury or the Deputy National Security Advisor or the Undersecretary for Political Affairs or Secretary of Defense or Ambassador to India or other very senior positions and people who are smart on it. So we hope that you enjoyed that, learned something from it, and thank all of you and all of you participants for investing so much time in it. Thank you. Thank you.